please click the subscribe button and the notification icon it will help us a lot hello guys this is rodrigo from level up and today i have an amazing invited here uh, his name is ryan lee and he is the ceo of curve he's a microsoft data scientist veteran as well uh, his startup has pretty much been chosen as one of the top 50 startups to watch in 2020 by the site built in saddle uh, they got 1 million in seed capital last fall and what curb does is that pretty much it brings artificial intelligence and machine learning to towards businesses and people who are not tech savvy who who, who do not have these uh, high skills to try to deal with them and to give you an example of what it can do is like, let's say you have an hotel, uh, you can use Corp to put all the to connect all the information about your clients using uh, the services like Salesforce uh, and things like that. Uh, then you can choose a model of analysis of machine learning that is already pre-built and then connect it to another services so that it can pretty much analyze all the data that you have about your company. And let's say, uh, one of the functions that this could have is that if you're a small hotel or something like that and you want to figure out who are your clients who would be most likely to come back to your hotel, uh, this app can help you do it. And again, like the, the idea of this app is that you do not need to know like all these tech, uh, high tech startup concepts so that you can use this app to to help you out with it. Uh, they are backed by, they are being helped by Y Combinator Startup Schools and Microsoft for a Startup. So without any further ado, welcome Ryan. Oh, thank you for having me. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your history? Like uh, how mm -hmm. did you get started into learning all these high tech skills and, mm -hmm. and how did you decide to go into building your own startup? Yeah, I think uh, it's a long journey for me. Uh, so. I, start, I actually started uh, my entrepreneurial journey started uh, during my undergrad. Uh, we actually had a startup uh, that didn't go very well. Um, and then I jumped into a larger corporation trying to understand exactly how business works. Uh, I worked at Samsung. Uh, so I was part of the original uh, smartphone incubation team. So I was a, one of the uh, first 10 people that started looking into the business, uh, smartphone business at Samsung. I was there about seven years. Uh, and then after that, I got my MBA over at Kellogg. And then I jumped to Microsoft. So at Microsoft, I was there for seven years. Uh, first f about uh, four years, uh, I was doing evaluations for startups. So I was looking at technology, uh, understanding startups, uh, driving acquisitions uh, for Microsoft. Uh, but I switched roles with Microsoft. Uh, so I was there, um, uh, a data science team asked me if I wanted to join the data science team as a program manager. Uh, I took the opportunity to actually jump in there, uh, did my tones in data science then. Uh, and then uh, while on the job, learned how data science works. Uh, and I saw this great opportunity where uh, a lots of people uh, that are not engineers, non-data scientists are coming up with more and more ideas on how to use machine learning AI in their business. And then uh, the epiphany was that uh, there's gotta be a service, a way to actually package uh, machine learning and AI so these people can actually start using them. So that was the, uh, the genesis of, of, of Curve. Um, and while at Microsoft, I uh, actually started prototyping, coming up with new ideas, how to approach this. Uh, I showed it to a few people. A lot of people said yes. If, if this was uh, available, they would actually uh, uh, purchase this. So I, I made the jump uh, from Microsoft over to uh, Curve uh, full time. Nice. And something that I have to admit to you, it kind of surprised me that you were already working in something like that because uh, Usually what happens, and, and, and probably you know already, like as time goes by, like uh, this kind of solutions start appearing. Like, for example, I have an animation uh, studio that helps a company to produce uh, great animations so that they can pitch their idea, their product, to either to investors or to their clients. But then there, there is this kind of businesses that start coming up of, hey, you don't need to invest like thousands of dollars into an animation. You can do it yourself. And of course, it is very basic, uh, uh, but it, it is kind of the service of drag and drop. And the same happened with web design. Uh, we have now uh, the Square. We have now uh, well, other alternatives. I, I don't remember the other one. It, I just gave my name, but you, where you can pretty much just drag and drop and, and people who who are not tech savvy and who, who don't have the knowledge to build a website, now they can do it. 
And obviously, in my mind, like for every industry that there is out there, like it, some kind of solution near to that is going to come up. Uh, but uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for me is like kind of new, uh, still in early stages. So it's kind of impressive that you are already working for this kind of solution for people who, who do not know how to do the technical part of, of using these technologies. So that kind of surprised me because it, it shows me that things are moving forward way faster than I expected them to be like. Uh, I, yeah. I thought this will take more time. Yeah, so the, the interesting you mentioned that. So every, every technology that is groundbreaking starts off by used by very core, very smart people, advanced geeks. Uh, so I think great, uh, uh, great uh, example would be the computers, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, they progress to a certain point where it becomes so uh, prevalent, everyone's using it. And then there is this interface, a way that the technology is, is packaged so everyday people can start using them. Well, not all the people, but people who want to use it can uh, start using them. Going back to the computer analogy, same thing, uh, right? In the, in the 70s, uh, it was based on, well, in the four, when they started in the 40s, it was used, solely used by the government for military purposes. Uh, and then it, 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 and it's, it was a tool that could be only by access by computer scientists. Uh, but how often do you hear the term computer scientists these days? Never, right? Uh, so um, personal computers start coming up, but it was still very, uh, a, a very uh, out of reach for everyday people, for everyday business people. It was based on uh, hobbyists, computer scientists, more than time. And then as the interface uh, progressed and evolved, it got more and more accessible to everyday people. Now came uh, MS-DOS. Um, a lot of people jumped on that wagon, but still untouchable by a mass majority of the people. Then came Windows, where uh, the GUI actually uh, created this interface that allows everyday business people to visualize what, what computers can do and actually using those tools. And, and it, computers is what it is, uh, is today. Uh, and the example you gave, right, uh, HTML website building. Uh, so there's uh, the first book website I built, I had to learn HTML, I, I, I hard-coded HTML code, JavaScript. But after a while, uh, tools like Dreamweaver came up around. And nowadays, uh, Weebly, Wix, uh, Squarespace, they are all um, tools that sort of prepackage the HTML into an interface where everyday people um, doesn't know a line of code can come to a problem, come to their site and say, hey, I am starting a retail business or whatever business. I need a website. All you have to do is already templatized, drag and drop, drop and stuff, uh, drop images into it, and you're up and ready. Uh, we believe that uh, machine learning and AI will do something very similar. No one knows exactly how that's going to look like. Uh, it could, is it something like a GUI interface or is it, is it like an app interface? What is that? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But inevitably, it, it is going to go there. And we want to be the company that actually is in the forefront of that. Yeah, definitely. I think that this is the exciting part about these type of technologies that nobody can predict how things are going to look like. Like for me doing these interviews and even, even though like I just have a couple of uh, more than 10 episodes already done, but the, the things that people are discussing that they are doing is, is just blowing my mind because again, like it, I just keep hitting that, that kind of thinking of, oh, I thought that this will come in the next 10 years and it's already being developed. And uh, so that, well, there is the, the, the love Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the names right now in my head, but there is a law that says, I think it's more laws that says that technological advancements are kind of uh, go two times faster every two years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is catching up like really, really fast in my head because I think, again, I'm seeing solutions like yours where I thought that, again, people, even people like me who are not, tech savvy on the same level that you are, mm -hmm. but I just know good enough so that I, I can take certain advantage of these technologies and, uh, and, and use them in, in a way that my competition mm -hmm. is not being able to do it. But, but again, so, so in my mind, I was like, okay, we will have, I will have this advantage for 10 years and now I'm seeing your solutions like, oh, this is advancing way faster than I thought. <laughs> 
Yeah, the technology advancements, uh, like Moore's law, you said, right? I mean, it's uh, it's uh, the doubling the capacity of, of conductor, semiconductors uh, every every eighteen months, uh, every eighteen months, and uh, it, it it follows an exponential curve, right? In terms of technology, and uh, technology advancement follows that exponential curve. Um, um, yes, and for sure, uh, I think. Uh, in five or ten years, AI will be in a space there we can't even imagine what uh, imagine the world uh, is going to be like. Uh, so it's going to be pretty fast, and uh, we have to be moving pretty fast as well uh, to keep in pace with that. Yeah, definitely. And when it comes to terms with these new technologies, what are new trends that you are kind of noticing that are popping up? Ah. Mm, what are trends? Um, so the general trend that we see that we we're in trying to democratize AI, uh, I think that's one of the largest things that a lot of companies are working on right now. Uh, the giants like Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, they are creating tools that make AI and machine learning more accessible to more and more people. And they do it under the slogan of democratizing AI. Uh, there are other companies out there, uh, startups, uh, that have, uh, are, are jumping into this uh, goal as well. Uh, but they're more curated and tailored toward uh, engineers. Uh, so their, uh, their approach is to democratize AI for engineers. Uh, and that's a common thread a lot of uh, people are doing. Uh, and there's, there's us, right? Uh, democratizing AI for every, everyday business people. Uh, so I think that's one of the trends that we're continue, we will continue to see. Uh, who will actually prevail and actually figure this out? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. It, it's it's going to be partially us. Um, that's, but that, that's definitely, definitely one thing that's, uh, that's there. Uh, second is that we do see a lot of uh, people get, becoming more and more aware of AI and machine learning, uh, not just the engineers or data scientists, but because of there's so much chatter and document literature out there uh, reporting on the effects of machine learning and what it can do to business, uh, more finance people, more sales people, more marketing people are becoming more and more aware of the power of machine learning. Uh, they don't necessarily have the ability to actually build those models, uh, but they have the potential and enough knowledge to be curious about what these models can do for them and understand them and come up with ideas how to ad adopt and use machine learning in their business. So I think those are the two things that we are focusing on in our company right now that we want to take advantage of. Yeah, and you just mentioned something very key that is that people who do not know how to do this uh, being able to kind of take advantage of it. Uh, and, and this, I think it comes in many different ways. So for example, we have interviewed a couple of a st a startup founders and CEOs who, if you ask them directly, uh, they tell you like, they don't have any idea <laughs> how the technology that they are building on and the company that they are building on works. Mm -hmm. But what they did was finding out the people who knew and, and, and kind of trying, this is a, a kind of different position in leadership because usually what people think with leadership means is that you go ahead and you are the one who, let's say, develop the technology and things like that. But yeah. in this case, the, the position that they are in is that they are trying to get the, 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 the people who know about how to create this stuff and, and try to put them into an environment where they say like, okay, uh, tell me what will be your ideal environment so that you can work at your best capacity and I will try my absolute best to provide that for you so that you can develop this technology uh, for the company. And, and I think that obviously that leads to a whole different set. So on, on that topic, uh, I wanted to ask you like, are you the one like, <laughs> going deep into the code and, and creating this technology or are you going into uh, finding more people to help you out to develop this uh, mm -hmm. for the future yeah um so like i said a while at microsoft i did my codes into data science while at microsoft uh, so my experience is uh, as a program manager managing projects uh, uh and working with data science to actually uh, solve those projects uh, as problems that uh, our internal customers would come to us um, so I do have uh, knowledge of how to do things at a macro level, but uh, for the expertise to actually really dig deeper and, and build more complex models to solve more complex problems, we have we actually have in, uh, data scientists uh, and working with the other data scientists to actually do those. So I'm more of a, what would you say, I'm a driver of the car. 
uh, I have basic knowledge of how the car works and I can do simple maintenance or simple tuning. Uh, I'll make sure the uh, car works uh, smoothly uh, to get to point A to point B. Uh, but I, I'm not the mechanic who actually is building the actual, uh, uh, the actual engine or the parts of the car that will fully uh, provide the full value. Yeah, and when it comes to these topics, I think, again, like we are in, let's say, we have in front of us, I think, a huge opportunity where we have now, we are now at the, probably the best time uh, of the history of mankind, uh, even <laughs> even with everything that's happening, I think that that uh, we are still in in a in a really good position, uh, and and I think this even the the situation of the quarantine is proof of it that uh, people like me, people like you, can still work online and, and keep keep advancing on their own projects, even though like uh, we are in, in into this very hard position that that we find ourselves in, and this is something that has never been able to like if this happened let's say 20 years before like we would not be able to do all these kind of things that we are doing now and which open i think a lot of opportunities for many people who who would be could be able to jump in and try to create something amazing but i think that sometimes it feels a little bit scary even i feel a little bit intimidating uh when when we face highly technological, uh, let's say, problems that we need to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that, like, how hard do you, do you think it is, uh, objectively speaking, for somebody who, let's say, has like a, a, a basic or decent uh, skills for the technological to jump into these kind of ideas and develop, and develop them? Because, uh, again, uh, sometimes, so far in, in my experience as an entrepreneur, there has been a lot of challenges that I thought were going to be like really, really hard to tackle. And when I finally faced them, I realized I, oh, this wasn't as hard as I thought it will be, right? So uh, when it comes to the, to the actual, let's say logistics or experience of learning this stuff, uh, and trying to kind of think in the, into this way of, of solving problems uh, through technology. Uh, and, and again, given that a person has a, like a decent uh, skills or tendencies to kind of jump into technological, how hard will it be for a, a person to kind of try to develop this or try to learn the, best, the basic things so that they can build a team to, to build a solution? Yeah, in terms of technically wise, I think it all depends on. Well, let me answer the question first. I, I don't think it's hard at all, um, and and this and here, here here's why. Um, it's not in in building sort of uh, building a company or building uh, building a, a solution. Uh, you should never start with technology. You should always start with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, that's where you're starting point. And uh, if you identify the problem, you should actually try to understand what is the simplest way to solve that problem that meets the need of the person trying to solve that problem. And a lot of times, and that's one of the core things in, in data science is that you see a lot of smart uh, PhD data scientists looking at a problem, immediately jumping into trying to build a neural network. Uh, and like, um, it would say, hey, look, look at this massive neural network I've built and trying to, extend, uh, and it's trying to explain it to you. I'm sure they're smart and there is advanced stuff, but uh, a lot of times the uh, a very simple a logistic regression model or decision tree could actually get to 80 or 90 percent of the solution, which is actually good enough to solve the problem. So in that case, it's not the neural network that you should build; it should be the logistic regression that you should be building. Uh, and it's and um, a first year uh, someone who actually did done an online course for machine learning uh, could actually build a lot of these logistic regression. Uh, granted that they understand the problem space pretty well in the data, data set and they can do the feature engineering. So that's, that's the approach you should be taking. So um, always identify the problem. And if the problem, uh, problem has the complexity uh, that you can understand, uh, but also if you, with the uh, less deep knowledge that you have, you can identify a solution to that problem 
and you think it's it's not big enough, it's not daunting that you can't learn it. You should you should probably do it, uh, and then you should you start with a very simple problems. Uh, it not, doesn't have to be a hundred percent solution the first time you do it. Uh, so uh, the the way I view it, identify the problem, prototype, even if it's crude, even if it's an on an Excel sheet, uh, show the person who has a problem if that's a good good enough solution. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of times they will say yes. And it's, it's kind of surprising how many times they say this is good enough. Now, of course, uh, for you to get more customers, you have to refine the, 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 the product that you have, how the, what the interface look like, ease of use and the quality or, the, or everything about it. But um, to get started, I think that's good enough. Uh, start there, identify what you don't know and start filling those blanks by teaching yourself. Um, and you'll eventually come into different problems that you haven't seen before because during the process of solving those problems and then those are new problems to solve just go and do your research and, and learn those and step by step you'll just get at, at after one year or two you'll have x number of projects under your belt and you would have learned immensely and you'll be surprised how much progress you can just make through that yeah definitely i'm with you on that <laughs> i i think that uh as you say uh, people are trying to put the technology before the problem and and that complicates a little bit things. <laughs> and also, uh, I well, seeing that you have the, the support of the uh, Y Combinator startup schools, uh, this is something that I wanted to ask you because uh, you're the first person that, that I'm interviewing that actually has a, the experience of, of dealing with Y Combinator. Uh, for people who don't know, Y Combinator is like one of the biggest if not the biggest uh, incubator in the whole world, like uh, trying to help a lot of technical startups uh, to pretty much go from the point of the idea to actually have a, a first prototype or something that can work into presenting them uh, for bigger investors. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, your experience uh, dealing with them and, and, and how was the process uh, for those who are interested in applying in, into Y Combinator and kind of take advantage of this resource? Well, I need to clarify, Y Combinator actually has two uh, programs. Uh, okay. One is the regular Y Combinator uh, uh, Accelerator program, uh, which is part of the uh, investments. Uh, they do two batches per year um, and then uh, you go to, well, you can't do now, but you would actually physically go to Silicon Valley to attend your classes. The second uh, program is the uh, Y Combinator Startup School, uh, which is an online course that, uh, that they, a curriculum that they've created, that they help you uh, through the process of actually uh, going through the process of actually building the company uh, and coming up feedback and different courses of curriculum. We're actually part of the second program. Uh, so we're part of the online program that we actually, uh, part of the curriculum that they've uh, created. Uh, and we're not part of the accelerator program uh, that, uh, that, that uh, you've mentioned. I just want to clarify that. Okay. Um, the startup school specifically is a free program that Y Combinator uh, has. Uh, so anyone can, uh, can, uh, can apply to it, uh, but not everyone graduates from it. Uh, there are a set of requirements that is required uh, in terms of uh, uh, meeting, uh, for example, uh, online participation, and then how much, how often you provide updates on how the progress is going. Um, for that. Uh, I, I believe it was a, a six or eight week uh, program. Uh, I forgot the actual week of it. Uh, so each week what we do is that they would pair you up with a group of start, startup founders. Uh, you would jump on a call and actually uh, have a discussion about uh, uh, the progress per year uh, and discussion about your startup uh, for that week. Um, and then uh, with that, you would actually provide feedback and get feedback um, from the other founders and stay connected with the community. It's a well, it's a great community uh, of founders uh, that actually exchange a lot of ideas. Uh, it's part of the program. You actually get lots of discounts for different services for startups as well. There are way, YC uh, alumni companies that actually come and provide uh, great discounts and, and, and uh, credits for you, uh, including uh, for example, Segment uh, is a great company that actually provides credits there. Uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft or startups also have credits that are uh, available to YC. Uh, YC startup school participants as well. Uh, so it's a great program. Uh, most of the programs are actually available. Uh, the, the, the classes, the video lectures, uh, Y Combinator does upload all that in, on YouTube as well. So anyone who wants to uh, look at all the videos can look at the videos, uh, but it's more, 
the, the, the curriculum itself is more curated in a, and try to keep you on pace on a weekly basis uh, of how, you, how to progress and how to measure yourself along the way. Nice. And this is, uh, this, this is a doubt that I have because uh, I tried to find the answer, but I kind of wasn't able to, to get it. But this is just for technic, uh, tech startups, right? Uh, Y Combinator does not accept all the other type of startups or do they accept uh, different kind of business? Um, in general, I, I believe they're looking for high growth startups. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, and a lot of times it just means uh, because of the scale that technology brings, uh, I, my understanding is that uh, it is mostly 100% startup, a tech-related startups. Uh, that's cool. Uh, the startup school, uh, I believe, is a little different. Um, so anyone can actually uh, participate in that curriculum. Um, so it's not limited to uh, technology startups. Uh, but... Uh, all the other founders are going to be highly technical uh, startups to get to so to get the most out of it. Uh, it's I think it's uh, it's better for you to be a tech startup to actually get the most out of that program. Yeah, and, and then again, like this is uh, uh, again coming back to the topic of being in the best possible era that we have been in mankind. Like uh, usually, this kind of resources would have been like block for only people who are in Silicon Valley and, and there is like that, but the, the fact that we can actually access this, this knowledge and go into YouTube and, and kind of get all, all these classes and all this experience, I think it, it is really amazing. And I'm really glad that you have talked about this because uh, again, like this is a resource that I didn't knew about. I thought like Y Combinator was like one whole thing. So I just learned something new that is very interesting. <laughs> And to your point about YouTube, um, a lot of the machine learning courses like Stanford, MIT, they actually have started uploading all their courses on YouTube. Uh, so if you have, um, and going back to your original, if you have a, an idea of how to build something and you're stuck at somewhere and you need to learn something, uh, YouTube is a great resource. Um, if you're trying to learn technical stuff, sales, uh, a Saster, for example, is a great uh, conference. Uh, they actually have great content on YouTube. I listen to all the time, trying to understand how startup marketing for SaaS, startup sales for SaaS uh, works. Um, and Andrew Ng, uh, the, the sort of godfather of machine learning over at Stanford, uh, has all his courses, uh, most of his cor uh, great courses on, on YouTube as well. Uh, so it's, um, YouTube provides a great way for uh, people who are trying to expand their uh, knowledge base. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think enough people are utilizing that enough. Yeah, to be honest, I, th I still think that there is like kind of a negative view on YouTube still. I know a lot of people who, who kind of make fun of other people who, who are learning things from YouTube. And, and as you mentioned, like there is all these resources. Like uh, I know a couple of channels of people who are billionaires who are kind of teaching what they know online just because they, they like teaching. Like, and they are giving their advice, their, the knowledge over there. And, and, and again, like, <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny to watch people uh, looking down on YouTube uh, or people who learn from them, but if you're following the right channels, like, there is a lot that you can learn. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And this is a question more going on to the, your experience as an entrepreneur, but when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you do to get back to your center and, yeah. and, and keep fighting? <laughs> You know, funny thing, a funny thing, great segue, uh, is, um, so two things. One is during the, if it's daytime, I could just go for a run and listen to audiobooks uh, while I'm running, um, trying to figure out what are the books or podcasts that are in the area that I'm trying to, I'm trying to solve or feel overwhelmed in. So if it's hiring related, so I try to find podcasts or books uh, that is regarding to hiring, so I would listen to that, go for a run. Uh, if it's evening, I can't go for a run. Um, I actually uh, go back to YouTube. So I look for videos or conferences or lectures on that topic. And I sit there and watch those and try to get my mind off a uh, specific problem and try to listen to what other people say about, about that issue and how they've solved it. Uh, that, or a lot of times I just have to turn off my brain. I, I go play video games uh, at night. Uh, and then go to sleep. Uh, I feel in the morning. I feel much better, uh, much more refreshed, and ready to tackle that problem. 
Nice, really nice. And this is kind of a tricky question, but uh, what is something that when you started this company, uh, hmm. something that you didn't expect at all that became true and it's really important to know for like uh, entrepreneurship in general? Yeah, I think this is true for all, all everything. Um, so one thing, interesting. So before I, um, so way in the back, so um, I, was in the, I was in the military. Uh, so I was in the U.S. Army as a CUSA, which is sort of uh, like an exchange, exchange student, but for soldiers. So I was a, uh, so I'm Korean. Uh, so we have a two-year uh, military obligation, but I served my term uh, obligation in the U.S. Army. Uh, so it's an interesting culture there where everyone, everything is very intense. Uh, and then there's a certain way of people are thinking where to try to get the job done. And um, that mentality carried off in my first full-time job over at Samsung. It was a very competitive environment where you actually, a lot of times you have to step on other people to get uh, above and uh, beyond people. Um, and that was sort of my um, sort of mentality for a while. Uh, and, but what I found was that uh, that being kind, it actually, uh, it's actually not only just good, but actually good for your career as well. Uh, and and uh, there's a book uh, Adam Grant wrote, uh, Givers and Takers, uh, uh, Givers and Takers, um, talks about this. Uh, there are category of people that actually get, just takes from other people. Uh, and there are category of people that gives, uh, tend to give to other people. So if you look at the hierarchy, a spectrum of people who, who succeeded, the lowest, the people who are the lowest, who haven't success, succeeded in life, are actually the givers. And the, the midsection are the takers. But the higher, extremely high people are the givers, as, again. And uh, it actually enforces, and uh, this is something I learned, is that uh, being kind and being uh, in, in any situation, just ha in general, having uh, other people, having empathy for other people, understanding, trying to help them in general, uh, comes back uh, and, and it's karma uh, or you can call it what you want, but it's definitely there. Uh, and I, I've seen this in, in, in my started as well. So as part of a large organization, you have so many resources and there are people out there that want to connect with you, talk to you and offer to help. But once you move, remove yourself from their environment and go, go on to your, on your own, I've seen uh, different, all these connections just evaporate. But there are those people that you have connected with and you sort of helped out along the way and went out of your way to help. Those are the people that actually come to you uh, in times, times of when you need it and, and extending their hand offering to help. And it has been immensely um, helpful. And in, in career-wise, uh, uh, career-wise and uh, uh, in your business, in your startup or anywise, uh, it's actually has uh, stronger uh, impact and effects than you would realize. So that's one of the things I've seen over the years that I have not expected, but I really find is very, very true. Yeah, I think that you just mentioned something very important that I figured out uh, as well a, a couple of years ago. And that is that, and, and, and it's weird when you have like the, the, the two words collide, <laughs> let's say, because uh, when I'm into these environments with entrepreneurs and, uh, and people who are having like, a lot of success in, in in their goals and the projects and things like that and you meet them you realize that they are like really kind people that they are really really trying to help you if you mention a problem like they they are trying to be there with you with you and and, and this is something that I, that I talk about many times is that uh, I say that the, the only reason why I have been able to do a, a, a lot of business and, and be kind of successful through all these years because I had a lot of people supporting me and, and, and it was like a very kind world because there were even people who never met me like face to face that like just like us talking right now but they were there like uh, missing asleep because they were trying to help me solve a, a problem in that moment and we were like late in the night working on that and, and I'm truly grateful for that but and eventually, obviously, that kind of stick to me and I'm trying to help people out. But I realize that every now and then, like I met somebody who is, let's say, not in that kind of frequency, mentally speaking, and that maybe they are the takers or more selfish people and things like that. And when you go to someone like that with, with this kind of good intentions, they, they kind of freak out. 
And obviously they are kind of thinking like, oh, maybe he wants somebody, something from me or something like that. And they just start like distrusting you a lot. And you, you can see kind of a, a revolution uh, coming from then. And, uh, uh, and it shouldn't have shocked me because I, I, I came from a, 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 an environment that was kind of hard. But I think I got easily used into these environments where people are kind and trying to help each other. And when I when I was when it was time to face again like this other kind of environment where people are not used to that, like it, it was interesting to see them freaking out just because you're trying to help. It's like okay, noted. <laughs> and if you were to meet like a a smart young driven student. Uh, who is about to enter the real world and, or maybe has an aspirations to become an entrepreneur, what advice would you give that person? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, 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 hmm. uh, one, actually two things that come to mind. One is uh, don't be the smartest person in the room. And second would be uh, know what you want, not what others want. Uh, and the first one, um, I think, I think when you're starting off, uh, you go into a new environment, you're, you're anxious to prove yourself worthy. You're, you're trying to prove yourself, you're trying to grow. And, uh, and a lot of people, I, I believe, uh, lack the sort of confidence and they're just currently building their confidence. Um, and uh, they try to over sort of compensate for that by trying to become the smartest person in the room, meaning that instead of growing yourself, you surround yourself with people who are not uh, smart. So you are, you feel smart. Um, don't do that. Uh, uh, and uh, the environment you want to be is that in your, in, if you're in a meeting, you're talking to people around you and you realize that you're the smartest person in the room, that you're in the wrong room. You need to change. You need to change. Uh, you go to another room. Uh, and I think you have to constantly do that. And, one way to do that, and the way I, I, I like to say, uh, is that you want to be in the mental state of, uh, of a challenger. You want to be understanding, you know, looking forward to challenges, and the mental state of, of I have no idea how I'm going to do this, but I will figure it out. I think that's the mental state you, you want to be. And, and, and coupling that with, okay, uh, in, the, in the room right now, am I the smartest person in the room? Yes, I'm in the wrong room. I need another room. Uh, so that's one. Uh, second is um, there's a lot of peer pressure, especially when you're starting off, right? Uh, so you have uh, friends that have graduated with you, entering the workforce. Uh, you see people who are getting uh, six-figure salaries um, in finance, consulting, tech, uh, major corporations, Microsoft, uh, whatnot, right? And they're comparing notes, at what's the salary and all that stuff. Um, it's really hard to do, but uh, you have to really understand what you want. Uh, what are you trying to get out of uh, out of life, and which direction uh, you're trying to go? Uh, only then can you start optimizing, understanding how to get there. Right. So uh, this is where you. This is where I am. This is where I want to go, and this is how I'm going to get there. Uh, to have that framework, you actually have to know where you're trying to get to. And then to understand where you want to get to, you have to understand exactly what you want, um, not what other people want you to do, but exactly what you want to do. And that I think will pay huge dividends because you wouldn't have to course correct constantly along the way and self doubt yourself uh, by readjusting what your goals are in life. If you can uh, set that early as early as possible. Yeah, and going back to the first point that you mentioned, I think, well, this is the reason why I'm doing this podcast. Like I'm, I'm trying to find people who are doing uh, crazy breaks that I'm used to seeing. Uh, who are working on, on, on very complex problems and and as well trying to learn from them <laughs> so so i'm trying to, to put into practice that principle that you just talked about and on the other hand if you have the same student that is about to enter the real world what advice should that person ignore mm -hmm. mm. conventional wisdom a lot of times are, are wrong uh, um so there's not one advice I would say to ignore, uh, but also always think for yourself. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of well-meaning people trying to give you advice. Um, and I would say in general, 
listen to the advice, uh, listen to the context and how he got, he arrived to that advice. Uh, uh, for example is when I started uh, a curve, uh, people would come and give me advice on how to start the startup, uh, funding and stuff. But if you look at under the hood, they have never started a startup before. Uh, it, there's, there's, it's just common sense. They're trying to give me advice based on their common sense. But though so many things in life are counterintuitive, a lot of uh, conclusions that you derive based on logic and common sense are wrong. Uh, so um, ignore advice from people that uh, are trying to provide you, uh, but well-meaning advice that you're trying to they're trying to provide, just based on pure logic and things they've heard other people say. Uh, but only uh, and only take advice from people that actually have the experience and actually have been in the trenches to uh, to solve those problems. Yeah, I think that it's really, really important because uh, I have had that happen to me as well. And and there is a huge difference between the advice on somebody who has the experience, who has done what you're trying to do, uh, compared to the experience of somebody who just has good intentions. Yeah. And, and again, like he's trying to follow up uh, uh, let's say logic or common sense. And there is also the thing that things that are like true changes and things that are true right now uh, will be outdated <laughs> or there will come something else. Uh, and, and well, a, a common example, for example, uh, that comes to mind because I study graphic design is that up to this day, I see a lot of people still saying that uh, if you are a graphic designer, or if you want to work with graphics, then you have to get Apple, for example, as a computer. Um, the reason why that is, is because Apple came with the first computer that had the, the a video graphic cards and where you could do video edition. And of course, if you have that, like <laughs> you, you could have done work faster than mm -hmm. other computers at the time. But now, like you can build your own computer and, and, yeah. and, and work so much better than than in an Apple computer and, and spending much less money <laughs> with the computer that you build. And, 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 and again, like this is like a, a very simple kind of thing, but, uh, and, and the one that we mentioned uh, a little bit ago, like people saying, oh no, like you cannot learn anything good in YouTube and such, you know, all this list of, uh, of great universities putting all their content, uh, Y Combinator putting out the content, like billionaires and millionaires putting out the content for free. So yeah, I think that, uh, things that might be true in the beginning uh, tend to change over time and, and we need to kind of be const on constant check on yeah. what is still true, what is still true, what has changed. Uh, yes. So, yeah, I think that that is really important as well. Yeah, and, and I think con context is key, like uh, really understanding context. Where does that come from? What is this perspective? Where does it say that? Understanding that. Uh, even outdated advice. Uh, like uh, wisdom of Yoda, for example, like they're timeless stuff. Uh, but understanding context, you can uh, unpack uh, a simple comment into multiple uh, elements and extract the ones that are relevant to you and exclude the ones that are not relevant to you because of context. Nice. And have you ever had like a failure or something that felt like a failure that actually set you up for success later in your path? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, early on. So um, like I previously mentioned, um, I was, uh, I served in the US Army in Singapore. Uh, and um, one of the things I, I saw was very, very effective was what's called an ARR, uh, after action review. What that is, is that it's basically a discussion or debrief that happens uh, after any field exercise. So everyone would gather around, talk about what went well, what didn't go well, how do we improve uh, for the next uh, field exercise and document that for any anyone to reference. Uh, it was immensely uh, immensely productive uh, and efficient. And it helps, uh, it creates a learning organization where the organization learns every every time they do something and the, none of that knowledge is passed on. I thought it was a great way to move forward. Uh, the next, while I was working at Samsung, uh, one of the first projects I led by myself, uh, which coincidentally was with Microsoft, it was in Samsung's joint project, one of the things I, I thought and came and stubbornly thought was like, hey, I should do an ARR with, with this project. We completed it. Uh, a lot of things didn't go well. Some things went well. 
So I, I, I propose that we do like a debriefing uh, to an AAR per se, to both Samsung and Microsoft, we put everyone in the same room and start discussions. Uh, that did not go very well at all. <laughs> Everyone started pointing finger fingers at each other. Uh, what, I, I would come up with, hey, hey, this didn't go very well. Let's discuss what happened. And everyone would just point fingers at each other. That was because of you, because of you, you didn't do this, because of that. Uh, and that whole thing blew up. It was as uh, I did more damage than there than uh, any time else. Uh, I, I think it was a great learning experience. Uh, so my initial naively thought that this, what worked great here would work great here. So I just, uh, and I learned that you can't just cut and paste certain things from different contexts to others and hope hope to work. There's lots of other things, uh, uh, other uh, parts of the uh, organization or that needs to be set up for those uh, new um, uh, things to happen, including different mindsets and cultures and all that stuff. I, I think uh, later in life, uh, in, in my career, um, I, I think uh, that taught me a little more being more uh, approaching problems more holistically, especially around new problems, uh, new ideas. I have this new idea how to do this. Okay, how is the organization going to respond to this? Is there a cultural fit? And just thinking through all the things that could uh, could inhibit or prevent this, this great idea to be uh, taking roots in this organization or this uh, this company. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one of the things that uh, I keep thinking about. Well, I actually think about that day a lot. It's very vivid in my mind. Yeah, nice to know. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, I have made similar mistakes in the past as well. Like thinking, uh, my case was uh, I went to Europe for like six months, and I was surrounded by all these entrepreneurs, and pretty much the, those were my friends, and I was hanging out with them every day, and. <laughs> The thing that happened with them is that, let's say you you talk about the problem that you're facing right now, they will hear your story and then they will come to you saying like, well, uh, you made a mistake. According to what you're saying, like you made a mistake here, 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 here. The reason why they do that is because they are trying to to kind of focus you in, into what is under your control. Mm -hmm. what, what is something that you could have actually done different and and, it, um, and you learn a lot in, in that environment <laughs> and when I came back and, and kind of with to my home and kind of with my regular friends because I had got used to that then somebody started telling a problem and I like an autopilot I just started like oh yeah well you know, according to what you said you just uh, screw up here 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 and they would react completely different because uh, in the, from the point of view, I was judging them. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, different environment. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I kind of get what you're saying there. It is it, it is definitely, you need to realize what the context of your situation is and, okay, and try to be aware of it. <laughs> and this is probably going to be a little bit of a selfish question uh, because uh, again, as I mentioned, we have an animation studio. And, and usually we have been working with TV ads and things like that, but we're trying to kind of move to to different stuff. And, and something that I would like to do is like uh, to start working with people that I love to be, uh, that I would love to work with and also to work to actually help projects that I actually believe in and, 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 and kind of excite me and, and, and help them out to kind of put like this huge pitch in, in, in integrate animation and, and help them out to get more sales, registrations, investors, whatever, right? So so I'm trying to, obviously, one of the goals of these interviews that I'm doing is trying to understand better the, the kind of people that I would like to work with. And I think that <laughs> you fit that, <laughs> that space. So what are the goals that you have for Curve? Uh, business-wise speaking, like, uh, what are you trying to do with it? Uh, what are your plans for the next uh, years with it? Like, what is, is it what you're trying to do? Yeah, uh, so first and foremost, our primary goal for this year is to find part of the fit. Uh, so for, for if you don't know what part of the fit is, um, it's, a, it's a direct alignment with what we're trying to build and what our value proposition is uh, in alignment with what the market of a subsect segment of a market is trying to uh, trying to get to solve a specific problem. 
So we don't know what this combination is. Who are the precise segments uh, of customers that we're going to target and what the problems look like? Uh, and what our exact value proposition is? And we're doing the different combinations. So we're looking at retail, um, retail, hospitality, uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, all the different variations of industries, uh, including gaming. Uh, and looking at the different uh, size of companies. Is it SMBs, mid-sized companies, or is it Fortune 500 companies? And what are the uh, target within those organizations that we need to be targeting? So we're, we're still running all of these experimentations on how to build a product, uh, how people are uh, responding to those products, what are the gaps that we're seeing, and tr trying to find that combination. Uh, so that is, the, for, first and foremost, our biggest our target. We're hoping, we were hoping to find that uh, pretty, very soon, uh, but with COVID-19 going on, uh, it might take us a little longer, um, but uh, our goal is to find that as soon as possible. And then once we hit that, uh, we hit that and we see this uh, engine that once we pour more gasoline into, it will run faster. We'll just get more, uh, we'll pour more gasoline uh, into the engine and then go faster and faster. And Based on what you just say, like I, I'm, I'm noticing a, a topic here that I see a lot, uh, I see coming up a lot in into these interviews is like uh, most people, especially people who don't have like a lot of experience building business, uh, they kind of try to do a lot of things at once uh, with the business and they usually fail. And what I'm seeing with these interviews is that people are trying to do what you just say, like trying to find what's the one thing that they should focus on and then like go full in. Uh, so one of the questions that I want to ask is like, how do you, one of the things that I think that get in the way of doing that is this kind of inner need of trying to, uh, oh, but there is this thing and there is this thing as well. And maybe I should try to do uh, all, all these things. So how do you should, should that up in your mind and, and kind of focus into the one thing? Yeah. So the our model right now is that we only build or do things that we know people want. Uh, so uh, we can have the best idea in the world. Uh, but unless someone we know for a fact that at least one person who needs it and wants it, we, we won't do that. So we can come up with 100 ideas, for example. Uh, you can't do all 100 of them. Uh, but there, you can actually probably validate all, all 100 of them really, really fast by asking one person, like, hey, all these have different ideas. Which one would you actually uh, purchase or commit to if you actually build it? Um, you can, you can pro with that, you can probably cross out like 90 of them and you stick to 10. Just talk to the second guy. You're like, hey, all the, hey, uh, which of the ones ideas that resonate with you? Or will you be um, and get those data points? Um, so using data to actually inform sort of where you should be practicing, I think that's the direction you should be going. Uh, uh, your mind um, has infinite uh, capacity to imagine things. Uh, so just following your mind is never going to work. So use objective measures uh, or relatively objective measures like people feedback. Uh, that's the highest level. Second is that. Uh, get people to actually sign contracts. That's a, that's a deeper level, or even get people to actually pay you. That that is that is the most important uh, uh, data point that you can get that the actual people want. So use these data points to actually make decisions. Nice, definitely. That that is really good advice on on finding out the things that uh, anybody as entrepreneur need to focus on, and. If you were able to get into a phone call with your 17 years old self, <laughs> what okay. advice would you give your younger self? Ah, 17. Um, so right before high school. Um, uh, well, first of all, buy buy uh, Yahoo stock uh, back then, and, and then buy Google and Amazon stock. Uh, that's the first one that I tell them. Um, oh, oh, since I wouldn't have any money, I would. I, tell me myself to tell my dad to buy that stock um that uh second is that as soon as you get into college uh, do more experimentations um uh, be more focused understand what you need i did a lot of ex uh, time exploring myself uh working different interesting jobs trying to understand what i want to do um but like i said uh, there was this phase i i did a startup while i was there but i wouldn't i missed the opportunity to make it to the next level uh, because of fear uh, of not being able to succeed. Um, 
And I would tell myself to really uh, don't index on the concept, over index on the consequences of failure. Uh, what I mean by that is um, when people think about, should I do something or not do something? Uh, they said, what if, what if I fail? And they, they attribute uh, almost infinite amount of negativity into that uh, uh, failure. But if you really think about it, right, what does it mean to fail? Uh, what is the consequences? It's not that big. Like, okay, you, I lose six months of time or maybe a thousand dollars or something, right? Uh, it's not that bad. And it can, can you rebound from it? Yes, you probably can. Uh, but uh, if you stop at, what if I fail? Oh my God, this is so scary. Uh, and not really understanding what failure means, uh, you'll not be able to do a lot of things you would otherwise be able to do. So I would tell myself, hey, don't give into fear. Uh, don't over index on failure. Uh, really do the assessment of what failure means. Um, and if it's the failure is something you can actually live with and rebound from, go do it. Nice. Is there any last advice that you would like to give the people listening to us uh, that we haven't talked into this interview yet? Um, other advice. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, there's like a few things that actually happened to me uh, that I think are game changers um, for in the, in the last maybe two or three years. Uh, one is I started meticulously uh, measuring and tracking my reading. Uh, on, so I used a, an app called uh, Goodreads uh, to track what I read. Um, and I started tracking that. I think it's, it's been a game changer for me. Uh, so the amount of, so at, at an annual, I track, uh, so I read between 52 to about 70 or 80 books a year. Uh, and I track that. And interesting thing is, um, is that uh, I don't, I try to approach it like eating. Uh, so you don't want to eat one food group too much. Uh, so I would read uh, science fiction, fantasy, business, uh, uh, business and self, self, uh, uh, self-help books and try to do a balanced approach of reading books. Uh, uh, I think everyone should do that. Uh, that is one advice I would, I would tell everyone to do. Uh, read, uh, read, read a lot of books. That's, that's like number one. Second is uh, what I learned in Microsoft. There's a book called uh, uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, and uh, it talks about a growth mindset. Uh, having a growth mindset, understanding that growth, having a growth mindset could, uh, could actually uh, help you, um, help you grow into uh, someone that uh, you won't otherwise be able to grow in. Uh, read the book. Make sure that you fully understand what the growth mindset is and try to incorporate that into your everyday life. Uh, and I try to do that. And if you don't know what that is, it's, it's a state of mind that understands that no, one, uh, no one's uh, ability is constant, it's fixed, uh, and everyone has the ability to grow. Uh, and one analogy I think one uh, is talked about is uh, if, if you go 400 years past and uh, ask a priest who, who, is, who is the intellect and then ask him, hey, how, what percent of the population do you think will be able to learn to read? Uh, they'll probably say about 10 to 20% uh, of the entire population are capable of reading. The rest can't read. Uh, that is a vast understatement. Uh, today, you know that 99.999% of the people can learn how to read, right? Uh, and that's a growth mindset. Everyone know, can learn to do something. Uh, and it's, it's not fixed. The capabilities will evolve. I, I think that's true for everyone. Uh, like, because you don't know how to do something now, doesn't mean that you won't be able to do something now. Uh, no, it's in the state of not yet uh, being able to do something. Yeah, I think that this is funny that you mentioned that because uh, it, until this year, I have a started like, uh, it, it is the first year that I have been starting to track my reading and as well using the Goodreads app and, and, and I put myself to the challenge of reading the 50 books this year. And, and now, uh, I have already read 27 books, so I'm like really, uh, really advanced in my schedule. And I got my Kindle here. <laughs> and, and again, like uh, in, in the beginning, I had started like rocking uh, these habits of reading uh, pretty much through here. So, so I was right. trying to start like really small uh, because I did lost my my habit of reading last year. So I wanted to pretty much recovered that 
-hmm. And I started very, very small. And, and, and what I found out that surprised me a lot that I thought that in order to read like this many books, I would need to kind of dedicate two hours or three hours a day. And what I'm finding out is that if I just read even 20 minutes a day, like it, it's it, it's it advanced uh, as long as I'm focused on the book. Like it's not like just reading and thinking on other things. Like if I really focus on reading the book, at least 20 minutes a day, like I can advance a lot really fast. Uh, and and even finding out tiny moments. So for example, I have a dog that uh, his hair is, is 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 like very thin, and I need to comb it out every day. So I put him in my bed, I start combing the dog, and while I'm combing the dog, I'm listening to an audio book as well to advance some things. So I'm, 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 I'm keeping reading on two books, at, let's say, at the same time, and one in audio format, and the other one is in the Kindle. And, and, and yeah, as you mentioned, like, you know, I, I'm really surprised how little time I need to read in the day and to advance a lot. Uh, I, I, I felt like, because I have read that, oh, most CEOs read about 55 books a year or something like that. I, I felt that it, it will need to take a lot of time to read uh, a lot of books. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised that I'm already way past, that it's just uh, been four months and I'm already past the half point of my goal. So yeah, yeah I, I you, think it's you, really important. You know, to that point, the interesting thing about like uh, the reading is that I, there's, I found that I throw a lot away, a lot of time just scrolling through my phone, like Facebook, Reddit, just just hours. Like like you can sit there looking at your phone for like an hour, low even knowing, right? Um, but uh, and after that, you do, actually don't know what you got out of it. But instead of doing that, read a book uh, during that time, and uh, it's it, it it adds up pretty pretty fast. Yeah, I took I, I took out all the apps from my <laughs> all the social apps from my phone because of, of exactly the same problem, and and pretty much I just filled it up with uh, I don't know if you can oh yeah, yeah. I don't think, but but pretty much I have the Audible uh, Kindle app and all these things so uh, podcasts and, and audiobooks have become the main use for this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that is great. So. And if people want to find more about you or about Curb, uh, where where would be the best place to do so? Yeah, so we uh, come to Curb, uh, K-U-R-V-V dot A-I, uh, and there's a website. Oh, we have a blog, or we operate a blog. I wrote a very article in it. Everyone likes, uh, we upload content on it. Um, so yeah, so come to our site, uh, check us out. Uh, if you are currently using Shopify or uh, Square uh, to manage sort of your, your data, your processes, uh, we have pre-built models they can actually start off uh, immediately on or if we if we don't have the products for you we'd love to look into how we can help you so if you're if you're uh if you have custom data or different using different data services to manage your your business uh or your team uh and you have a problem you're trying to solve uh ping me uh you can reach me at ryan at curb.ai uh, i'd love to talk to you uh so feel free to reach out i'd love to uh hear from you Awesome. Thanks a lot for giving us your time and being here, uh, providing your knowledge, sharing your experiences. I really appreciate that you have taken this time to, to talk to us. Oh, likewise. Thanks for having me. It was a great time with you. Okay, so this has been the last episode of Level Up. Uh, I'm going to position all the links in the in the post for this interview as well. Uh, if you like this interview, please click the like button below and subscribe to our channel. Or if you're listening from the podcast, then please subscribe to our podcast so that you can be notified when the next episode comes up. Until next time.